Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. Perrin, we've got a great guest here. We the one, the only guest. Brian Wheat from Tesla. He's got a new book, Son of a Milkman. Uh, on Post Hill Press, it was already released on December 1st. Vanna White, please show the book. Yeah, I got, got it right up there. <laughs> All right, there you go. This is a paid for copy. I, I enjoyed the book so much, I wanted to buy a copy. And if Brian gets back to touring and I see him, maybe he'll sign it for me. There Hopefully. you go. Absolutely. Okay. All right, first things first. Why did you decide to write this book, Brian? Like, what was it? One day you woke up and go, I'm going to write this book, or you just had to come out? Well... No, I mean, I talk about it in the book early when I was in uh, therapy with Dr. Hirschkoff. He had talked to me about 1990. So one day you should consider writing a book. I think it'd be helpful with you and your anxiety and stress, you know, letting shit go. And I went, yeah, great. You know, sure. I'm going to write a book in 1990, right? No one gives a fuck. Um you know, but I mean, it was part of his uh, therapy, right? He said, well, if you just write it down, you you let it go. So I said, yeah, cool, whatever. But I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't write nothing down. I just kept barreling through my life. But when I hit 50 about eight years ago, I went, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've been doing this Tesla thing for at the time, I think it was 25 years or something. Um, maybe it's time to write a book about my life. Maybe someone would be interested, right? And, you know, then now that the book comes out, I'm 58, Tesla's been a band 35 years. It's like, okay. So that's when I decided to write a book, I'm, you know, when I turned 50. So, so Brian, you know, I guess picking up on the book, you've written a very honest book and perhaps the therapy aspect is why. And as I was reading it, what I was curious was about is you weren't just very honest about your own existence, you know, within Tesla and outside of Tesla, but you were very honest about your bandmates existence, about Troy, about Jeff, about Frank, you know, demons they might have, relationships, e even Tommy who's no longer in the band. Do you kind of talk to them before this comes out and say, hey guys, you know, I'm writing this biography and it's going to be pretty honest or they know that's just you and they accept it you know so well what's, what's it's funny about? you say that because i spoke with jeff about it and i said hey look i'm gonna write. he said brian write whatever you want it's all true right yeah frank actually interviewed for the book and and on the first draft so he kind of knew what was in there and they both know that i'm gonna i'm honest and i'm gonna tell it like it is Skio, I don't speak to, so I didn't ask him anything. So I actually probably could have said a lot more about him, but was bound not to by legal things. That makes sense, yeah. Um, Troy, I didn't really say. I mean, Troy knew I was going to uh, tell it, you know, like it was. But the thing is, and Troy got a little bit bummed out because he thought maybe I was still mad at him over those things. I said, Troy, I talked about those things because they happened at the time. I also go on to say, you know, in regards to me and Troy, like, look, we had a lot of, we butted a lot of heads more so than me and the other guys. But today we're fine. You know, we've been fine for many years now. But at the time, as I was writing this book and doing it in kind of a timeline fashion, saying, well, look, this is what happened during Psychotic Supper or Great Radio Controversy, you know, Troy came to recording sessions and then we didn't see him. He took off with some family. You know, that happened. You know, he and, and Troy's been in recovery for 27 years. So I'm sure he would tell people this. You know, he does. He talks to kids in school. So... I guess to answer your question, yeah, I did speak to them, but there was one thing I, I left in the book that I thought maybe Frank wouldn't want me talking about, maybe because it's kids or something. That was the thing 
where he left that big boulder of cocaine in the toilet uh, yeah. and called me over and said, hey, look, I quit. And I was like, fuck, why did you quit? I could have did it, you know? Uh, and I called him. I said, hey, do you want me to take that out? He goes, no, man, my kids knew I did drugs. They know. I mean, I don't lie to my kids. So, that you know, they were pretty cool about it. You know, and it's not like, and it's like, I talk about the drugs we did and, you know, some fist fights and stuff, but I didn't really, you know, I didn't talk about anyone's, you know, uh, personal, really personal life, you know, about, you know, sex or any of that stuff. So, and, and there was nothing really to say, you know, and, and that certain things are meant to be left private. They were. Well, well, Brian, I think you've done a really good job. Like, and I'll, I'll show the book again. You know, again, we, we, we read a lot of these biographies here. And, you know, the knock I have on some biographies is that they come across as a uh, VH1 behind the music. They tell you what you kind of already knew. And there's really not much there for someone who's an avid fan and wants like a peek behind the curtain. And one thing I appreciated, I've been a fan of the band since, you know, the beginning, since 86. And there were things I didn't know. There were a lot of things that I learned and yeah. it was all out there. So if people want to understand band relationships, if people want to understand the business, if people want to kind of understand what goes on good and bad in recording sessions, like I, this was not behind the music. This was really uh, warts and all a very uh, interesting peek behind the Tesla curtain. And I think you guys, you know, you allude to it a little in the book, right? Like bands like Poison and other bands you might have toured with kind of have reputations. You guys didn't necessarily have this bad boy reputation, but here you are describing how your management team who worked with a lot of other high profile uh, bands, like almost didn't want to have anything to do with you guys anymore because you guys were maybe a lot better than it seemed, you know. To well, we were paid in the ass, you know. The, the, their problem was, you know, obviously it's pretty well documented that, you know, towards the end of our first part of the career that Tommy Skeel had problems. So that, you know, that they didn't it, dig that. And then, you know, we, we had a hard time after a certain point, I think I talked about it in the book where we wouldn't really listen to anybody. You know, once we had a, a good amount of success, by the time we got to Psychotic Supper, you know, and especially after they didn't want to put Love Song on the album, the record company and the management, you know, that was always our thing. Well, if we played them something, they said, we didn't like it. We'd say, well, you didn't like love song either. You know, that was always our comeback. And I think Cliff and Peter just got tired of that shit, you know, and at a certain point we weren't worth the trouble. We probably gave them, you know, because look, and in, in that in any business, it's all about the dollars and cents, right? Yep. And, you know, they had Def Leppard and Metallica who were making millions and millions and millions. And Tesla never achieved that level of success. You know, maybe if we did, they would have tried keeping us from breaking up or, you know, who knows. But I also said in the book that I think I'm more proud of the second half of our career than the first half. And then Steve Thompson got upset <laughs> Because he's like, you should be proud of your first three albums. It's not the records I'm talking about. I'm talking about the band persevering. And, you know, the second half of our career has been us all on our own, doing it ourselves. And that's what I'm really proud of. I mean, look, the first half, we had the big giant machine. We had Q Prime. We had Geffen Records. You know what I mean? We, we had MTV. We had all these things that, you know helped make bands big but the second half after we got back together it was all up to us to to carve out a niche for ourselves and we did and, and i'm really proud of that brian do you think if you uh, throw enough money at any band enough money they will be successful no no i don't i think i think i think if you throw enough money at any good band yeah Yes. I remember Jeff Tate said, you know, you just throw enough money. Yeah. And he meant a good band with good songs, right? He goes, if you throw enough, enough, you get that big machine behind you, things will happen. Well, yeah, because at that point, it's all about position. 
you know, it's, it's positioning, it's positioning. And, you know, at the time it was in magazines, it was positioning in the record stores. It was being, you know, at the top of the playlists on MTV and stuff, but it had to be good bands. It couldn't be shit bands. So, um, in, in some degree that yes, but in another degree, uh, then you had a turntable uh, hit. That's what they used to call it. When you throw enough yeah. money at it, you get a hit, but no one's buying the album. That's yeah, it wasn't was. reactive. Yeah. All right, let's get to this. I want to know what it's like to be on tour with David Lee Roth. Um, you know, you talk about in your book, David was more of a... Is he the guy that you see, that we all see as fans? I mean, I've seen David Lee Roth in concert, so his parent. Is he that guy that you see and you see on TV? Is it the same personality? Well, he's always in David mode. Yeah. Right. So, but to be quite to be quite honest with you, I only spoke to him one time the whole tour. You kind of see his motions and the way he is. And I was reading a book. But, you know, you know when he walked in, back, you know, when he walked in the room, it was all David mode, and it was all, <laughs> you know, that whole hey, it's Dave TV. Um, yeah, he was like that. I mean, that's that's what I that was my take on him. But I. Like I said, I only got to speak to him the one time and he wanted to manage the band. Talk about coming out of fucking left field, you know? He was just like, hey, I really like you guys. I want to manage you. And we're like, whoa, okay. Well, we got this management company, Q Prime, Cliff Bernstein, Peter Mitch Kratz. You've heard of him. Um, so that was it. But yeah, he, he was that way. I mean, you know, and he, he had, you know, it was funny because they used to they used to say, "Look, if David comes down the hall, go into the nearest available room and get out of his way," you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he had this big bodyguard, Eddie Eddie Anderson, and he would say, "Okay, Dave's coming, get out of the way," and we'd all run like scared little chickens into the next room and shit. And then I talk, I think I talk about it in the book where Poison tried doing that shit to us the next year when we were on tour with him and i just said fuck you i ain't going nowhere <laughs> you know i did that shit when we were in rookie ball and you know that's when we were david lee roth it was rookie ball but the time we got to the tesla tour we were all-star already you know we were on the all-star team and they were trying that crap and uh uh, you know, I laugh about it today and me and Brett laugh about it and stuff. But at the time, <laughs> I was like, I ain't going anywhere. Yeah. So, so Brian, a relationship that probably straddles, you know, the early part of your career and the late part of your career is a relationship with Def Leppard, which, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen uh, a camaraderie between two bands like you guys have. So, I mean, you guys toured with them, you know, in the early days when you were both they were big and you were breaking. Uh, now mm -hmm. it feels like every other year you guys go out on tour. And I generally get the feeling it's because you guys like being around each other. And then again, for the people who don't know, book plug one more time, you know, <laughs> forward by Joe Elliott. And, oh, uh, you and, and Joe Elliott um, really kind of speaks fondly of you in the forward. And you refer to him a couple of times in the book. So describe this relationship between you guys and Def Leppard and how that all works and why it's worked. Um. Well, they're kind of like our big brother mentors, you know. We we started out with them when we were just starting to develop. You know, after David Lee Roth, we went on the Hysteria tour, and they they took us under their wing, and we did a lot of that Hysteria tour. And even before that, we kind of modeled ourselves after them. Used to play their songs when we did covers, you know. Um, and me and Joe, we just bonded one night in, in New York in rehearsals for the American tour over Paul McCartney he came to me in Frank's room. And we both had this love of Paul McCartney and wings. And we just connected me and him. And we've always been really good friends ever since then. And he's the same guy now that he was then. He's never changed. So all the success, the ups and the downs, you know, the hysteria success, the rebirth success in the last five to 10 years with those guys, Joe has always stayed the same Joe. And uh, they're just solid guys. We like playing with them. 
the show is a good show together that both bands together makes for a good show. I think that's why we've been with them. You know, I think it's been uh, f- three out of the last six years. Right. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's all I can it's remember. Just, it's just, it's just a good match. You know, if you, you take but, but, Def but Leppard and back, Tesla right? and you, you put another big band in the middle, you got a nice summer package. But but Brian, it goes way back. We're talking about high and dry. Did, did, when did you first meet him? Like it was on Hysteria? Or was it? Well, I I met uh, Rick Allen and Pete Willis when I was a kid, a fan. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like I mean, it goes way yeah, back. Yeah, I, I, I met him at High and Dry, and I went back to their hotel and smoked weed with Pete Willis and Rick. Pete Allen. Willis, Pete Willis, man. And then, He's... and then four years later, I'm on tour with them. They're my peers. <laughs> what was so Pete Willis like? About a, like a a Cinderella kind of story thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what was Pete Willis? I mean, I mean, I don't know. To me, I was always a big Pete, Pete Willis fan. You know, the first two albums and Pyromania. Well, he was really short. Yeah. Yeah, he was really short. And he had these little elf boots on. But he was really cool. And then some. one of my friends that was with me said something to him and kind of pissed him off. And Rick Allen is exactly the same Rick Allen from that night in that Holiday Inn after high and dry tour that he, he's the same guy. That's the thing. All those guys, Joe, Sav, Phil, Rick, they're all the same guys. They're all the same guys they ever were. And, you know, I was really close to Steve Clark, you know, too. So obviously he's not around anymore. And I'm not that close with Vivian, but we are friendly. Um, you know, but those, those four guys, there's a strong bond between them and tesla i think they look at us like we remind them of themselves when they were younger they're not that much older than us though that's the thing yeah. you know i think jeff and joe are the same age yeah i guess this career-wise they started so young and kind of broke at such a young age that just uh that's true you know, too the couple yeah. albums ahead of you just in that sense is because they started yeah i mean with- they were 18 and i think i was 18 when their first record came out wow yeah. Because yeah. I was 23 when I made Mechanical Resonance, so you know we're we're pretty much the same age. Yeah. So, on another thing that I didn't know and I learned from this book is, I guess apparently you and Jimmy Page are like pretty good friends, and I was pretty cool reading about your relationship of Jimmy Page and having jammed with him and just. You know, the, the that's like surreal, right? That's, that's yeah, like that's all like right. Like so, all the guitar guitar players out there, their jaws are gonna dropping, saying, "Wait, like how does the guitar, uh, the bass player, and Tesla, you know, have this long standing relationship of Jimmy Page?" So, like, uh, probably because I'm not a guitar player. Yeah, <laughs> for one. And you know, I met Jimmy backstage at Hammersmith Odeon in London with my good friend Ross Halfen, who is like jimmy's brother they're like brothers those two Mm -hmm. and you know when i met jimmy ross said look don't fanboy out on him dude he'll fucking he'll he'll blacklist you right so i just when i met him i was just like you know hi he said hi how are you you know everyone flocked around him like they do when he walks in a room you know poor guy um when all that settled down, I said, hey, I'm going to go. It came back over, you know, to me and Ross. And I said, hey, I'm going to go get something to drink. Do you want something? He said, yes. Yeah. So I went and got him something to drink. And and uh, I came back and he said, hey, uh, I, I said, here you go, Jimmy. So oh, thank you. He said, hey, I really like Five Man Acoustic Jam. I think it's great. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> he goes, Five Man Acoustic Jam, your record. I said, man, I didn't even think you knew who I was. He went, of course I know who you are. You're Brian and Tesla. We're we're on the same <laughs> label. He said, I love your record. You know, it's the first, you're the first band to do an all live acoustic album. And I went, whoa, you know, wow, great, man. Thank you. You know, what a compliment, right? And just from that, we just became friends. And when he come into town with him and plant i went to the show and hung out with them a couple of, you know a couple of shows and then i would go to england a lot to see ross and 
you know, and me and Jimmy would see each other with Ross and we just developed this friendship, you know, over the years. And, you know, now we're, we're, we're really pretty good, but we're real good buddies. He's the like, one that got. Do you like text each other? Records. Like, do you guys like text each other? Like I. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I texted him the other day. We, uh, okay. you know, he, he got. He's the one that got me into to collecting vinyl records again. Cool. Because cool. I would go, I would go out with him and Ross, and they would go to these record fairs, and I would, I'm like, guys, I, I don't, you know, I'm into CDs, and Jimmy would say, Brian, they just don't sound as good. I went, ah, oh, you're nuts, you know, yelling. Yeah. The, the I, you know, how could a vinyl record sound better than a CD? And I would just go to a coffee shop and then we'd meet up for lunch, you know, after they went or a bookstore or something and they'd go do their record thing. So one night I was at Jimmy's house, me, him and my wife were going to go to dinner at this little uh, place where they read poetry called the uh, Troubadour there in London. And so he said, come around and we'll, we'll go from there. And he had, as I was there, he put on the original Johnny Burnett trio version of Train Kept Rolling, right? The Aerosmith mm -hmm. song, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On vinyl in his living room. And I went, holy shit, he's right. This does sound better. And from that day on, we just, you know, I started collecting vinyl. And when I'd go to London, we'd go to all these record, you know, fair things together and stuff. And yeah, so it's it's turned into a, you know, I mean, over the years, it just he's he's my buddy, and you know, he's a, I had his pictures on my wall when I was a kid. He was my hero next to Paul McCartney. He was my, you know, it was Paul McCartney, him, and then Freddie Mercury, and uh, I was lucky enough to to meet Paul a couple of times. And when you think about, if you would have told me when I was fifteen, hey, one day you'll be really good friends with Jimmy Page. You'll go over his house. You'll, you know, honestly, man, you're fucking crazy. Yeah. You'll, be Page. <laughs> you'll be texting of Jimmy Page. You'll be texting Jimmy Page. Back then, you didn't know there would be a thing called texting, nor did you know no, Jimmy Page. No, no. Yeah, like... Pen pal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alice Cooper. What, okay, you toured with Alice for a while. Uh, what was he like to tour with? He was cool. He was really cool to us. Again, he was more of a kind of recluse. Like you would only he would only come out of his bus and go on stage. Mm -hmm. Then he'd go back to his bus and he'd leave. You know, like he didn't travel with his band. He had his bus. He did his thing. And again, we saw him, you know, the last night we all got together and he thanked us for being on the tour. And, you know, he was really kind of normal. In, in the sense that, you know, he, he he's mellow. Whereas Dave is like this persona, this David Lee Roth, larger than life rock star. Uh, you know, the whole thing with Alice is it's an act on stage. You know, the whole Alice Vincent thing. Uh, and he's great. We see him from time to time. We do benefits with him for his Christmas shows and stuff. But he, he was super cool. He was he was he, really accommodating. He, he keeps her locked down though. I mean, because he doesn't want to be influenced by drugs or alcohol or anything. Yeah, right? that was I mean, the whole thing, you know. So he didn't, you know, he didn't, you know. I think that's why he kind of sticks to himself and stuff. Yeah, and I, and I also heard that some artists will get thrown, or I don't know how true this is. Artists will get even thrown off tours with him if they do drugs around him, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, or alcohol, and I don't know. Truthful yeah, matters. I mean, you know, we like we certainly didn't have any restrictions put on us, but like I said, again, we were never really around them. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, you yeah. it wouldn't be like you would see him in catering in the daytime. Yeah, yeah. he Where came into the venue to... right before he went on stage, and he left right after he got done playing. Before all this COVID stuff happened, weren't you supposed to tour with Alice? I don't know if it was summer. Yeah, or last fall. year, the yeah. summer that got shut down that was going to be alice tesla and lita ford we had like 25 shows we were going to do yeah how great was that i know I was yeah thinking... we were really looking forward to doing that with alice are you going to be doing any live streams what do you think i don't think so no i i don't i you know i i just tesla's the kind of band that that feeds off a crowd you know, it's a live experience. 
it's when you say live, it's live. You know, the pantomime, you know, it's hard for us to do that. You know, that's why we were never really that good at probably making videos. You know what I mean? Because we weren't, you know, we weren't like White Snake or Poison or, you know, when you look at those videos in the 80s, I mean, those guys were fucking good at that shit. They used to lick you their know. bases. So. Yeah. We really, <laughs> yeah. You know, Brian, I mean, we don't we see you licking a, a base. Yeah, we don't we see you licking a base. crowd to play off of. So I hear you. I hear you. having said that, you know, I don't, I, you know, we got kind of approached earlier and just went, ah, you know, I mean, look, if we don't get to play this year and then maybe we'll consider doing one and do it purely for the fans because, you know, they're probably Jones in the see us and maybe it'd be more of a kind of round table thing where, you know, we play and people kind of like we set up in rehearsal and just, let everyone yeah. stream in and talk to us and play songs for them instead of like, here's our concert. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And Brian, you know, more you're an interactive thing. So Brian, you know, it's well documented that you're, you know, part of the the business side of Tesla as well. Uh, what's your best guess? What 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 are your thoughts on getting back to touring? Getting, you know, is touring going to be what it was before? Is it just going to be weekend fly-in dates? Uh, is, is that even feasible economically? Just well, I, I think, look, I mean, you guys are aware of the election troubles. We're oh, yeah. Yet. It's like, yeah, we got to get through Inauguration Day first. Right. Let's get we're in Canada and we're having here problems. Find yeah. out, <laughs> you know, if, if, who, if Trump's going to be president or Biden, uh, you know, because it really... I mean, I don't know what they tell you guys up there on the news, but you can't really trust the news. It really is up in the air. And, you know, there's there's some crazy shit down here. The, half the country's one way and half the country's the other way. And it's pretty scary, to be quite honest with you. If the powers yeah. to be say it's okay for people to get back together and go back and and watch concerts then yeah we're ready to go we'll go we'll go play there'll be no difference in doing a tour or doing weekend shows it's all about letting the peoples in the building and the people wanting to come in the building to see the show so that's what the whole thing is um so i don't know i mean who knows you know i i think once this political thing is settled down here I think it's going to have a lot of impact on the COVID thing. And we if, only ask because, you know, we're fans too. And everybody wants to see you and so many other bands back out there. That's what yeah, no, look, everyone's look, hoping, look. you know, everyone's we, we want to play. I don't think, you know, some people realize that this is what we do for our job. Yeah. You know, this is how Tesla earn a living. Tesla aren't, um, you know, we never achieved that really height of success where we became millionaires you know where we we could afford to not work for two years yeah we th it's our job this is how we this is our you know our it's our day job <laughs> yeah yeah well, well, not you to know, mention so, crew. Yeah. yeah you know look we we need to get back to work but and we want to you know what i mean so it's kind of it comes at us in a lot of different ways you know, the effect of COVID on Tesla. It's not just, oh, we miss playing and we miss playing for fans. That's a given. We always do that. But the other thing too is, is, is it, it, it's hurt us financially. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and because we make more money than, than the average Joe, you don't get any uh, subsidy that all the other people get. Yeah. So it's really been kind of a, a weird thing, you know? Okay, yeah. here we go. Last question. Ready for this? All right, Tesla. What's since you've had all this time in confinement, or I guess some of us had, have you written material? Are you, you know, you're working on an album? I mean, that's one thing you can do, right? Well, yeah, but we again, we have to be in a room together. Okay. Okay. So I'm in New York. Troy's in Nashville. Frank and Jeff are in Sacramento. Dave's in San Francisco. We're all of the age where some of our parents are alive, some of our parents are still de are dead. So people don't want to get around each other because they don't want to get their parents sick, right? 
mm-hmm. because old people were at high risk. And autoimmune, right? autoimmune disorder, right? I mean, that, right, that yeah, plays yeah, a role I, I'm too, not right? At high risk. And, and I got to tell you, man, I've been traveling all over the goddamn world. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm on a, I, I, you know, I mean, I go back and forth to Sacramento from New York or Texas every other couple of weeks to work in my studio because that's the one thing I can do. So mm-hmm. I have been working on soul motor. I've, I've got like 25 soul motor songs done because, uh-huh. because that's me and the singer. It's a little bit easier mm-hmm. than have trying to put five guys in a room. Um, but Tesla has it. But what I will tell you is that when we do get back and we start playing again, then yes, we will make another record because we'll have a lot to say. So, you know, like my buddies in Def Leppard, they're making a record and they're all over different places in the world. They just send files to a central place in Ireland. We can't make a record like that. That's not how we, we do things. And God bless them for being able able to do it but we just can't okay. yeah well, there's organic there's organic and there's manufactured and i and you describe it also in the book that your method of songwriting and creating is is kind of maybe more organic or old-fashioned than some other bands yeah it is we are very much kind of in the old school kind of way you know and you know when we did the record with phil Collin, that was the newest approach to making a record we had ever taken so uh, but again we were all in the same room are you going to be working with phil again i'd like to i don't know that we will okay only in the sense that we never really try to do the same thing twice so that that record was a a real attempt at making a very produced record and, um, you know, trying things make basically like making a record the mutt way, mutt lang way of making records. So we did it. I think the record was great. Unfortunately, a lot of hardcore Tesla fans didn't like it. They said it sounded too much like Def Leppard, which, I find kind of odd because I think when Jeff sings, it doesn't sound like Def Leppard at all. Yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll personally work with Phil again. Absolutely. And who knows, you know, um, it wasn't a bad experience at all. It was great. I enjoyed it. I was a big advocate of doing that record with Phil. Uh, but, you know, Tesla has five individuals in it with, different opinions so i think the next record will go a different way maybe a bit more organic you know instead of so produced and maybe we'll try doing this one on our own which we've never really been able to do and i've always said look we always have to have somebody because we'll you know we'll argue too much over and maybe i need to like take a different mindset and say okay let's try it at least right yeah, right. see if we can do it and then if we get into a bind let's recognize that we're in a bind because it's how we work and we we need that mediator like we always do so i think in all fairness we should try it on our own and then if we're able to do it great if we're not we got to recognize it and not let it get so far out of hand we actually start fighting <laughs> all right on that note i gotta go but on that note thank you so much brian for being on the show and thanks uh, for having me so yeah. there you go uh son of a milkman go pick it up there it is Ta-da. amazon i'm sure you can find it everywhere <laughs>